Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 55th episode of By the Bywater. It is good to be back with you all. And uh, let's just get things cleared out of the way. We don't know yet if the Writers Guild strike is being settled today as we record. But, you know, we assume the last and best final offer includes giving Oriana everything she wants and needs. So let's all cheer and applaud for her right Empress now. Empress of Yay. television. I have, been, I have been named Empress of television despite not even being in the guild yet. What an honor. Thank you well, to everyone. Yeah, I mean, you got to get somebody who's not part of the system right? to take over the system. Exactly. Because we've seen that work so well. Obviously. <laughs> Model of America. Get someone in. Their their experience have been around and doing other things, right? Even though they have nothing to do with it. Get them in. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 <laughs> Perfect. So, and on that note, otherwise, we certainly hope you're all doing well as we are moving through what remains of summer, what remains of uh, what get going into fall, darker weather, rain. Seasons. Yeah. <laughs> seasons. Yes. Are you experiencing seasons again out there, Ariana? Oh, are you I loving am, them? And I'm loving it. I'm loving the, the seasons. I've made two pumpkin baked goods in the last few days <laughs> it's great <laughs> it's not even october yet so as for me i had my own go back to nature experience a couple of weeks ago with my family went up to the sierra nevadas for a few days marvelous marvelous um you know and again even something as simple as stepping out one time from the little cabin we were staying in and just again going actual stars in the mm. sky <sighs> you know i'll, I'll i will take that you know just you know, <laughs> tolkien and stars are a big thing yeah. and that was one of my like trip out moments it's not that i've never seen them that way before but you know very it important, is so. it's kind of like the first time every time though oh yeah it, yeah it, it's just so beautiful i remember seeing in joshua tree seeing seeing the stars like that it's just mm. like oh my god i think mm-hmm. somewhere in oregon we saw you know the milky way it's just incredible mm-hmm. it, it is genuine i, I get it <laughs> it's good to get so and we hope jared of course is doing well as always and things like uh, this uh, eight million pre-orders coming in yes for uh the west passage we hope no idea what <laughs> all right people pre-order more <laughs> pre-order. no it's not like i get like a little odometer going so i have no oh my idea God. I, i'm glad that would i know oh. oh i'd be so stressed i'd be like there's only 50 or whatever like yeah pre-order it because i have been under so much stress the last few months trying to get all the illustrations done and i need it to be worth it <laughs> Yeah, Jared works so hard for you all. The least you can do. <laughs> I give and I give and I give. And <laughs> until now, I've never asked anything in return. <laughs> Not a single thing. Not a single thing in my life. <laughs> I'm God's favorite little martyr. Small, <laughs> so. small bean Jared. <laughs> well, we, we could go on from here, but I suppose that would take us a little off topic as we go on all these directions. So amusing though it will be. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and get get into things. We do, of course, have a main topic to get to, but first uh, we do have some news as always. So Jared, please do take it away. The biggest news is pre-order is open for my book. Like what else is there to talk about? Ooh, Come on. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Come on. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, it's it's been a bit of a light month for news. Uh, so we'll just touch on a few things here and there. The revived Lord of the Rings musical in the UK continues to receive thoughtful praise and critique. And a couple of recent comments from the cast and creative team hint at the idea of doing something more with it following the uh, formal conclusion of its current run later in October. So something to keep an eye out for. It'd be interesting as well to see if there's a cast recording based on the combined singing musical performances of the ensemble, but no word on that as yet. On the broader entertainment front, as of recording, both the writers and actor strikes are ongoing. As always, support them in full. But in a sign of how streamers are starting to admit they want more money, Amazon has joined in with more competitors and saying they'll be introducing ads to their offerings unless subscribers pay more. <sighs> so get ready for the Rings of Powers uh, second season being matched with hair care products for that natural elven glow. <sighs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I read the news and I'm just like, can I move to the North Pole or something and right. just not? But in a you know, in a delightful turn of events, what a workshops gaming division in partnership with publisher private division have announced a self-described cozy game coming out next year called tales of the Shire. 
word is that this builds off a license from the original texts rather than simply being an extension of the Jackson film arcs. But beyond that, no further details are known yet, though it's got to be better than that Gollum mess a few months back. It's, it's got sure. to be better. <laughs> God, I miss, I miss the Gollum game jokes. <laughs> they were good. I, they, I, I that, was, that brought out the best in the internet. Yeah, I definitely like got introduced to new youtubers uh <laughs> because of that because of that game yeah boy imagine if it had been a huge huge tr- just entire troll just to drive on that that thing that thing right there to get engagement from random youtubers for just the hate yeah. play <laughs> so. or the kind of thing that you put out just to retain copyright Exactly. Oh, or man. like yeah. warren Beatty with dick tracy <laughs> no jeez is that what that was <laughs> yeah so yes. he yeah yes. he, he, mm-hmm. you know every whatever years he does a dick tracy thing uh oh so that, oh, so oh that. i thought you meant mm-hmm. the initial like the movie oh, itself and not no, this no, 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 okay. no, no, okay. yeah it's kind of like same thing with spinal tap there for that's what i was we're, thinking we're, of with yeah, spinal tap yeah. <laughs> yeah we're moving a little off topic so maybe back to the more about this cozy game so much as we know which is nothing and all that i think this is a good idea i think you know i think there's yeah. been more and more of a thing about you know i know ariana was very <laughs> thrilled about the idea but just something sort of like it doesn't have to be another big war or quested game yeah, yeah. do something fun <laughs> I hope there's like a gossip stat or something. <gasps> oh, <laughs> some mechanic cool. for I love this <laughs> social status. Yeah. Right, I, like I, I'm just picturing Stardew Valley, but the Shire. Like that's that's it. That's mm-hmm. that's the game. <laughs> I don't know. I would be. I would like that. I would be okay with that. Be a little farmer and yeah, yeah. form your little relationship. I've never, from, I've never played Stardew. I don't know. Yeah, I think there is an element of fighting skeletons or so. I've never made it in that Stardew far. Valley. Yeah, like in the mine. There's mines. I don't know. It's a okay. Whole, things you learn but yeah no there have been other like you know there was that I'm sorry i was going to look it up uh there's a sort of that game you noticed a couple heard about a couple of months ago it's sort of like we're just sort of a like a forest witch but you're not like doing evil things you're just going around and like you're collecting your mushrooms and just doing things like that and Hell I'm like, yeah yeah i mean sure let's have something like this i am fine with this i am totally fine with a game in middle earth that is simply just the hobbits living their best lives perfect <laughs> so yeah. you know I, I i have no problem with this is just sort of an indulgent thing and the involvement of what a workshop yeah, kind of interesting we'll see where it goes so yeah. and and as for everything else yeah really not much more to note except of course as we say again please keep supporting the strikes until you're otherwise we're almost there hopefully yeah. maybe God, I, hope this out, I hope this is outdated by the time the episode comes out yeah, right? like, yeah, oh yeah. it was yes. resolved and they oh, got yeah. what they oh. wanted like yeah 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 rumors are flying that it might be resolved as soon as tonight rumors if this is a lie it's a lie <laughs> so you know we'll just you know leave it at that but uh we'll see and if there's more news next time we'll tell you but right now there's not much more than that everything's quiet now in fact i think we should be glad because uh if i remember right and their whole idea was to try and do rings of power season two and say that drew the trailer about a year out or something like that well we still haven't seen something and uh, that's <laughs> fine by me <laughs> so, just keep editing away whatever slot i don't miss have. it <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Mm. But let's put that behind us now. Let's go back to the source and uh, we'll do this. So uh, the choice of topic has come back around to me. And so I will begin. In our previous episode, we discussed the fragments from Tolkien's planned novel about time travel, The Lost Road, written in the late 1930s as part of his incipient expansion of his mythology to more fully embrace the story of Numenor, just prior to beginning work on what would become The Lord of the Rings. That effort proceeded to take up the bulk of his creative energy for a number of years to come, but in 1945, Tolkien took a long pause as he prepared for what would be the closing third of the novel to work on an effort that, in some ways, was something of a sequel or even a soft reboot, to use current terminology, of his original idea about Numenor's fate having an after-echo in the modern world. It's one of his lengthiest efforts among his never-completed narratives, and it's absolutely one of his most unusual creative works, period. Indeed, arguably, the most so. The Notion Club Papers is simultaneously incredibly dense, sometimes wryly funny, and also among his most unsettlingly cosmic works, stretching not over space but time, to provide something as close to a self-analysis of what exactly he was trying to do with his creative impulses in life. All the more so because he was still only really known as a writer for what was simply seen as an engaging children's adventure tale with The Hobbit, with the publication and success of The Lord of the Rings still many years to come. 
The Notion Club Papers is perhaps first and foremost the most meta of his works in general, as well as the one that is closest to his actual life. Set in the projected future of the 1980s from his 1940s vantage point, it itself purports to be a collection of notes and remembrances, edited at an even further point in the future from there, leading us to debate as to whether the remembrances are actually from the 1940s directly, from an Oxford-based gathering of academics in a regular club, very explicitly in a similar vein to the famed circle of the Inklings that he was a member of, along with C.S. Lewis and numerous others of their fellows. Christopher Tolkien presented the work as something of an addendum in the History of Middle-Earth volume Sauron Defeated, which contained the final manuscript drafts of The Lord of the Rings, before turning to both the Notion Club papers themselves and further heavily intertwined manuscripts revisiting the story of Numenor's downfall for the first time since The Lost Road. Even read in their own right, though, the papers are worth consideration, though they are absolutely not the easiest of reads. The first part of the papers moves into the story of one of their number, a Hungarian-born professor named Michael Raymer who first presents a science-fiction, to use his terminology, story, about space travel, and then faces an objection from a club member about the realism of such travel using spaceships. The subsequent debate during this, and then in more detail in a subsequent meeting, leads to a startling description from Raymer about his extensive reflection on, and then pursuit of what can be summarized as travel via dreaming, a sense of being able to traverse both distance and, with time, the question of communication to explore other worlds in the solar system and far beyond, as well as encountering numerous spirits in those realms. It concludes, after it must be said a lot of practically Socratic dialogue, with a vivid description of one such mental journey and the worlds that he encountered before returning to a particular planet that turns out to be Earth in the end. The second part, in contrast, focuses on another member of the club, Alwyn Arundel Loudham, hopefully I pronounced that right, whose first and middle names are very consciously and specifically related to what turns out to be Tolkien's legendarium, Arundel being related to Arundel, and Alwyn being a variant of Alfwine, thus more specifically tying back to her current naming convention in The Lost Road in particular. Loudham begins talking about his own dreams being more vivid, and in a dramatic moment reacts to an unusual and remarkable storm coming out of the Atlantic with languages and names that are related to the Numenor myth an invocation of eagles coming out of the west, a great enemy who has corrupted Numenor, and more besides. He and a colleague, similarly caught up, disappear for a while afterwards to later report that they've been on a seaside journey looking to explore further into what has happened. This leads to report further drawings and ideas from the Lost Road, time travel to Saxon England, stories of King Sheaf and more, as well as sharing more not only on the history of Numenor and what proved to be the key sole source for another of Tolkien's invented languages, Adunaic, the native speech of Numenor itself, but a source for a separately published poem by Tolkien drawing on the stories of St. Brendan, Imram. While Tolkien reworked this material more than once during this time, with Christopher Tolkien sharing earlier drafts and variants before the final form as Tolkien had it, before letting the project go entirely to return to his work on completing Lord of the Rings, it otherwise did not specifically recur in his writing work for his remaining decades, with Loudham arguably being the final version of the figure it first introduced as Ariel in the Book of Lost Tales nearly three decades prior, a bridge between the mundane world and that of the mysterious and the fantastic. But beyond that, the Notion Club Papers is heavily suggestive of Tolkien's own state of mind, especially in the passages from Raymer's point of view, of how he seemed to be processing what compelled him to create in the first place, dating back to the early pre-Middle Earth paintings he created, as much as the legendarium itself. Much more so than the minimal visions of modern society that he created in The Lost Road, Tolkien grounds himself in much more familiar territory, at ease with his academic peers, almost to the exclusion of everyone and everything else, while at the same time writing some of his most experimental work in turn. It's a lot to unpack, and so it's time for me to open up the floor. Boy, this thing! <laughs> it is, it's, but, you know, I hadn't read it since it first was published back in, uh, I guess, 92 is when Sauron Defeated came out. I can't recall. But, uh, you know, I vaguely remember it was like, yeah, there's a bunch of professors sitting around and then weird stuff happened. I hadn't realized how much of it was professors sitting around and have re remembered how weird it got. It's <laughs> yeah. basically the way to do it. But what are some of your initial impressions of the thing? <laughs> so picture me as the emperor from Amadeus. Um, <laughs> Too many layers <laughs> mm -hmm. is like it's so. I mean, I found it, I found it fascinating on some levels, mm -hmm. but also it's just so dense. Like mm -hmm. literally, I was taking notes at one point. It's like all caps. Why is this so dense? Like it's there is too much going on for the point to really come across very well. Is my start my thesis statement? <laughs> I guess. 
Yeah, I absolutely hated this. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I go. am not Here surprised. I was pretty sure you would. I yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> hated this. And I can completely see why Tolkien like did not return to this after a certain point and gave up the ghost. It reminded me, so I, I do, I like Wes Anderson as a director, and I think he mm. actually does what Tolkien was trying to do in mm. a... Like, he actually succeeds in what Tolkien is trying to do. And, I, you know, the one that comes to mind is, like, the the Grand Budapest Hotel um, okay. as, like, mm-hmm. a good example of, like, extremely nested narratives, what we're doing with them. Asteroid City, Wes Anderson's latest, is also a, a good example of this. Mm-hmm. But because those are, like, audiovisual experiences, like, you can kind of just let them wash over you mm-hmm. and you don't have to worry too much about, like, wait, I'm not exactly sure. Is this, like, you know, it's it's Wes Anderson making, uh, you know, commenting on, like, the artifice of art, you know, and, and using the artificiality to to tell different stories. And, and that's cool, even if sometimes I'm like, can we, can we, can you just tell me the story? Uh, this is, like... <laughs> You are using this incorrectly. You are using mm-hmm. these nested narratives in a way that, like, I don't think you, like, it's, he's, I think he was working it out and mm-hmm. not exactly succeeding. And because he had, it's like he's taking these three very specific interests that are, mm-hmm. again, they are so, so, so unbelievably specific. Like, <laughs> sitting around reading work and Shoot, shooting the shit with your professor buddies <laughs> and like okay that's cool but is that really of interest to anyone but yourself mm. uh, is that really the fertile storytelling ground that you think it is and in my opinion and you know it is just an opinion i want to make that very clear I, there's <laughs> lots of things that people can glean from this work that are of value but oh boy (laughs) yeah well at its core it's kind of like the classic horror movie setup of like a group of friends who accidentally Mm -hmm. summon up something yeah um Mm -hmm. where they're sitting around and talking about like this process of being able to dream this Mm -hmm. this was i found this part so cool raymer is basically talking about being able to dream the dreams of the world yeah like Mm -hmm. his whatever process he comes up with he doesn't go into detail Mm-hmm. Uh, which is good because otherwise I'd probably try it and just lose my mind. But um, um, he's like, he wants to travel backward in time. Doesn't think he can do it with the machine or something. I can't remember his act. There's a, there's a lot to remember here, and I don't remember most of it. Yeah, but however, yeah. he's, he's the, he comes up. Yeah, he's like, I'll I'll try since since dreams can sometimes seem to foretell the future. Maybe I can use them to go backwards. Something about memory. It's so mm-hmm. it's so in- intricate and whatever. But at one point, he's talking about like being able to try to read the patterns that are inherent to an object kind of like what we were talking mm-hmm. about in the nature of middle earth mm-hmm. where everything bears the print of what's happened to it and if you can read those you can like mm-hmm. dream the past of this thing and he has mm-hmm. this moment which is i thought actually kind of stunningly gorgeous where he, it, he kind of does this to a meteorite and then mm-hmm. dreams mm-hmm. the experience of being a meteorite mm-hmm. and it's beautiful and then from there, we progress into almost they're kind of like, as more of the professors kind of get into this, they're like kind of summoning back the disaster that destroyed Atlantis is kind mm-hmm. of what's going on, which is very Charles Williams, who was another inkling. Mm-hmm. But it's because these friends summoning up a horror movie monster kind of thing are all Oxford professors <laughs> being written by an Oxford professor. Mm-hmm. The first, like literally the first half of this thing is them talking about the fictional device of the spaceship like yep. it yeah yep. and what it means and what it does and whether they like it or not and it's just like okay i'm sure this I'm sure this was fascinating to you if you were actually having this conversation in real life like as a conversation it feels kind of realistic but mm-hmm. as a reader trying to get through this and go mm-hmm. like i don't i don't know these men so i'm mm-hmm. not interested in what they're having to say and that their characters don't really come across because it's so it's just Tolkien dividing himself up in different ways. Yeah, if yeah. Mm-hmm. it is very like a Socratic dialogue, except less pithy. <laughs> yeah. And Socrates is a lot funnier, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, it, it's hard, although I think necessary, to pull out the stuff that you could argue is, say, you know, more intrinsic to sort of reflecting on, you know, sort of the legendarium, as well as the parts that are, um, 
you know, as sort of like you know, more technical, because as Christopher Tolkien describes, really they're very heavily intertwined with Tolkien's uh, revamping of the Numenor myth around that time. Mm-hmm. And there's something I'll bring up more about that later, because there are bits of that throughout that I think are very interesting. But I think it's a weird comparison, but... Um, I kind of felt like what we were sort of addressing when we talked about the essay, A Secret Vice. And what Mm -hmm. I mean by that is this, even though that, of course, was a straightforward essay lecture presentation and not this, in both cases, he is... I don't want to say desperately trying, but he's really trying very hard to try and sort of square these very particular, you know, creative aspects of himself Mm -hmm. in a framework that can be understood by the audience he's most comfortable with. In the one hand, uh, Secret Vice is him actually putting in a lecture, hey, you know, I do this funny thing over here, ha ha, you know, it's sort of like that implied sort of sense of, you know, don't make fun of me too much while I'm telling you about this, (laughs) uh, you know, that's or which sort of almost over poisoned it a little bit. It at some point, even though he did have quite a lot to say about uh, where he was coming from, is very helpful. Here, he's not giving, he's not doing that, but he is trying to sort of express it now through this particular fictional framework in a framework that is something that for him is sort of like, oh, I can get away with this. I deal with this stuff all the time. I mean, you know, it's uh, of all his fictional works, it's the one that's the most literally academic in tone to the point mm-hmm. where he's got these layers, not merely of these notes of this meeting, but people interpreting the notes of the meeting mm-hmm. and arguing yeah. what's going on there. You know, a more successful and arguably more funny version of this, you know, you can see this being sort of a proto postmodern thing if Tolkien was that sort of thing yes. about something, you know, there, there's yeah. a realm in which you could do that and have me on some other subject. I can think of 8 million writers who could do something like that and actually do something with these sometimes, you know, overdone academic setting, but it's out there. You know, I can, I can name a few, you know, a stretch of this could be in the right hands, something Pynchon would love to do with like, you know, I found this thing that was edited by this thing, you know, to name one writer, there are many other writers you can apply this to, but Tolkien's not that writer. (laughs) It's problem number one. And then, uh, and then, and then what you've got is the sense that uh, I think Oriana's right, even though there are notes from Christopher Tolkien at points indicating things like how certain characters seem to be more based on some of the other inkling circle, more specifically here or there, it very much is a case of not merely subdivided, but but he's also reacting to kind of everything around him. In some respects, this Mm -hmm. is him him reacting, uh, Jared rightly brought up uh, Charles Williams, who's definitely a preach to this. This Mm -hmm. feels like his weird equivalent to something like if how can I put this? If the Lost Road was meant to be his sign of like response thing at the same time that C.S. Lewis is writing out of the side of the planet, this feels like his attempt to sort of like, okay, let me use my sort of response to that hideous strength, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is the most Williams-like of the three space novels by Lewis, is the one that is set in Oxford and weird, weird shit happens <laughs> in mm-hmm. blunt terms. Um, and it is but, the worst uh, one that has to be said both of these writers <laughs> imitating charles williams are doing it badly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is a good point and this this portrays my lack of knowledge of much of williams so i will i will completely defer this judgment <laughs> so but um but uh but but yeah it's it, it's this um I, I, i'll try and end on a quick point here so we can uh, turn things back to you guys but um this this idea that uh he's 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 trying to do something sort of like okay i can i can fit in my ideas into this familiar framework and it's something that we we all know and all that, but it's so hopelessly weirdly insular that you sort of mm-hmm. have to come to it going like, going like, oh boy, I'm digging through a lot of stuff here that just it's 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 a slog, and that's something yeah. that Tolkien rarely is in his creative writing, for lack of a better term. He is very rarely a slog. He may can be more formal, but he's rarely ever so like, oh my god, I'm exhausted. <laughs> You can you can sense the effort that he's putting into this, and mm-hmm. that's never a good thing to sense in, yeah, in fiction. He, he really feels like he's tying himself into mental pretzels. Yeah, you see, you see, you feel the effort in trying to keep everything straight and trying to keep characters like there just isn't quite enough differentiation of characters when they speak which is kind of a tolkien issue in some cases um a lot of this is very sort of first draft problems yes Mm -hmm. in some ways where there's like a character who is suddenly extremely important and it's like yeah Yeah. on the next on the next pass you would bring him in a little bit more but it's suddenly like oh my god we've got that classic tolkien male bonding thing and it's like if sam was introduced suddenly in the mount doom chapter like it's (laughs) it doesn't work again it is a first draft thing he would have fixed that i'm sure but it is it makes it hard to read like these aren't characters Mm -hmm. they're just kind of again tolkien talking to himself there was a great comparison i read once or a thing talking about the character of 
or detail rather, talking about the character, the the famed uh, uh, character Inspector Morse on from the British uh, TV adaptations mm. in uh, in the eighties and nineties, played by John Thaw, and uh, the critic was responding, I believe, to the original writer Colin Dexter. I can't remember who uh, created the character for the books, and he said that that while you know uh, while a strong series of good performances, the problem with the characters originally conceived by the author was that um, he mistook like you know preferences in life, you know, in this case Morse's uh, Morse's affectation for, you know, for what was it, jazz or just, you know, or particular kinds of music, you know, mm. beer in a pub and all that for having a personality. <laughs> <laughs> and that too was set in Oxford, so maybe it says something about Oxford. But the point is, these characters here have quirks mentioned here and there that are substituted in place of personality. There is no personality between any yeah. of them. They're yeah. all they're all at the same level, except some things happen to them more than others. And even then, we don't get much of a distinction of personality. They just simply change due to outside, outside influence, for lack of a better term. I mean, there's the the closest thing to a guy sort of like is the one guy who always seems to be asleep, but then he wakes yeah, up and yeah. him and sort of like you. I'm I'm with you. That's exactly what I would be doing. <laughs> I did enjoy the way that it's almost like the Father Christmas letters, where mm. the various because these are the notes of a meeting, you know, yeah. and mm-hmm. they all have to sign that they were there and everything. And that conceit could work so well, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. maybe in the hands of a different author. But there's moments where they're like arguing each, with each other in the notes. Yeah, and it's so funny. And I love that. Be, yeah. It would be so great if there was just more of that yeah like, yeah <laughs> if like if if most of an entry so you know the conceit of of this work is that it's you know notes from specific nights of these meetings and it feels like i feel like a sort of david foster wallace ish version mm-hmm. of this would have like yeah. all like an entire night's notes would be like one sentence and then the rest of it would just be arguments from say all this the men- or whatever yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. you know just evolving and like that could be so fun um mm. but uh, again ned as you said that's not our guy and it's just <laughs> like, yeah no he's, he's he's someone who recognizes that humor and someone who you know you could see that these are broken off into like a quick anecdote or like a, a two-page sketch of or like what a typical meeting is like and then just have something a little argument like that to be like oh mm-hmm. that'd be really fun but that'd be its own thing and that again while we still be hopelessly insular would be hopelessly insular for an understandable reason it would have an audience yeah. of about 10 people sure you know that type of private joke and you know we could all look at it and like oh that's nice and but we quick and it would be done this is yeah. not quick and this is where we sort of stumble ourselves in it's interesting because i mean you know again as dense is the word the layering going on here but it's one of those things that you try and you know, the more you can strip out some parts of it to sort of get into what's going on the more the more fun I shouldn't say is the word more interesting, <laughs> honestly interesting and weird it gets. Yeah. Um, Raymer of all of them seems to be the one closest enough to Tolkien's own vision of what what he's getting in his brain and how he's trying to process it. I think it was the best way to put it um, in terms of a general sort of you know creative thing. It's you know this it, it's something that it doesn't have the feel of actual direct autobiography. Um, but it's almost sort of like Tolkien going like, what the hell am I dealing with? Where am I getting this from? And how can I express this? And this is kind of the only way he seems he can express this. And he's doing yeah. so in a very sort of odd way. Um, but it's still fascinating. I mean, because if this had been strictly Tolkien's own like analysis of himself, it would be something where it would be sort of like we'd only be looking at Middle Earth. We'd be only like, I dream of this world or something like that, conception. Mm-hmm. But he's going off to all these other planets, these other ideas, these weird fast the crystalline planet that's living and breathing alive it's sort of like mm. <laughs> where were you for star trek my guy you would have yeah. been perfect you know these talking on t- lsd would be yeah you know kind of fun the, it fe- that one in particular feels like did someone dose you and you like had kind of a weird trip where you like looked at a snowflake and were like man what if what there if, is a whole world of what snowflakes? if this was a yeah <laughs> 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 I mean, it's in then his his sort of like return to Earth thing, where he certainly like you know looks at Earth as sort of this alien observer as time mm-hmm. being sped up as mm-hmm. like you know yeah. he says, and then the inha- then the inhabitants did things, then structures sort of came and went. This crazy acceleration of time. It's sort of like 
you know, again, there's something there. There are these like little images that suddenly creep out and make their end of Raymer's sort of, you know, extensive monologue, for lack of a better term, sort of like, okay, here we go, you know, things like that. But yeah, I mean, when it's down to the minutiae of uh, sort of like, you know, arguing over whether a spaceship is a good idea or not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mama. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's also, I mean, it's vaguely interesting in the sense that you're, of course, you have to remember it's written for the time before actual ro- people were being sent up in rockets mm-hmm. and the idea is only became a little more concrete and these days people just sort of like yeah spaceships we got space stations whatever you know right. this is a case where it's yeah. sort of like you know all that and uh, they arguably were also this uh, Tolkien was looking at going like look it would take time to get places which is true very <laughs> but, true yeah you know, so there's I, that. I would love to like somehow have Tolkien watch the movie Interstellar like, and see like <laughs> what do you think of this man I feel like he would be into it yeah is that yeah. I, I kind of feel I th- like I think, he might I be into it more than some yeah <laughs> <laughs> I loved of... Interstellar, by the way. I yeah. like only watched it for the first time recently, and I was like, "Hell yeah, I'm I'm all in." I was I haven't d- seen it. <laughs> I, I was catching up with my Nolan too recently. I mean, for reasons obviously, and things like this, and I had missed that one. And I'm like, okay, um, mm-hmm. you know, and all that. So I do, I do think it has it has something going for it. Uh, but uh, that makes another podcast so, yeah uh, yeah to bring it to bring it back the man himself i do it is interesting bringing up these little beautiful visions that like uh, yes i did hate this but those were <laughs> like i kind of hated it because there were these little beautiful moments and mm. i was like oh that's cool and yeah. then it would end and we would go back to the oh god just yeah. the yeah. sitting and the talking and the abstract but it, it was like ha- Kind of like what I was saying, I think, in the Secret Vice uh, episode where it's like, I wish that he had had the courage, not courage, the the confidence yes. to have these <laughs> kind of weird visions and just be like, I'm going to write like just a little chunk, just a little story about this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not actually in the vein of a lot of the other stuff I do, but I'm going to have the confidence to just be like, you know what, I am just going to, I don't have to tie this into stuff that I am known for. I, yeah, or... I don't have to interrogate yes. everything about it before I yes. get to it. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which was like, I... yeah, like he's clearly working through his thoughts about the space mm-hmm. trilogy and what mm-hmm. that means to mm-hmm. have a, a spaceship in this weirdly like Miltonian universe of inhabited planets Mm -hmm. with angels and stuff. And, and like, that's a chunk of it is like, well, what, like literally what is the spaceship and the space trilogy doing? Like, Mm -hmm. what does that mean? And it's like, you don't, we don't need that in order to get to the device of mental space and time travel. Mm -hmm. You can Mm -hmm. just go there. You can just do it, man. Yeah. You can just do it. (laughs) It can be, it can be a reaction without you going, this is a reaction. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, well, to my, to my mind, at least, you know, yeah. After you get through the first part, at least the second part, gets more interesting comparatively simply because Tolkien sort of like returns to that's where we start getting Numenor erupting again into Mm -hmm. the modern day and this to me just feels more interesting we're still stuck with these characters who are essentially interchangeable but then things start to happen Mm -hmm. (laughs) kind of things they're actual there's actual activity Uh, the key thing of course being the uh, the storm which as Christopher Tolkien noted with with amused irony years later is like oddly enough in that particular year and it actually happened England did have a horrible huge terrible storm so it was only you know, four months off or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I remember the news reports about the storm at the time. It was something very notable. So, hey, predictions. Um, and uh, and this idea that all of a sudden, you know, something is sort of like, you know, their their cozy academic setup has suddenly been suddenly just crushed into. Now, Loudham has uh, been saying about he's experiencing more of these strange dreams himself. Now, the comparison point that hadn't hurt, occurred to me at the time, because I hadn't read it, but uh, but now is just ineluctably there. And I, I wouldn't be surprised to be you maybe thought this too, Jared, is sort of like, oh, wait a minute, this is reminding me a lot of Lovecraft's Call of Cthulhu, the original story, because the setup for that is that a whole bunch of people start having weird dreams about mm-hmm. something happening, and it builds up to what turns out to be a notable storm and a big psychic event. It's sort of like, what the heck happened here? Now, it's much, much different, of course, uh, for one thing, uh, well, you know, less overtly racist, but, um, <laughs> but uh, and the setting is different and so forth. Yeah, kind of minor detail, but it is interesting that it's the same sort of device, this idea that there is a psychic uh, disquiet that is settling in, only some of these characters that is only reflected by outside events and the whole is the sense which again we look back to the lost road that we just talked about in the last episode 
the idea that all of a sudden the past is crashing back in on the characters and all of a sudden we're now getting these visions of time again and we return to all the stuff that we saw in the Lost Road. We get King Chief again. We get the Saxon, late Saxon, England setting. All of a sudden well, two of the characters are suddenly there now and we're remembering these times. So it's one of those things that are like, okay, here is Tolkien's second draft, you could say, of the idea. Um, whether or not it's more successful, I don't know. Though <laughs> I mean, what, what do you think about this all? Well, it's funny. I it didn't remind me of Call of Cthulhu. Hmm. I was just not in that headspace, I guess. Normally, a lot of things <laughs> remind me of Call of Cthulhu. <laughs> um, <laughs> what it reminded me of, weirdly enough, maybe not that weirdly, is The Dark Tower by C.S. Lewis. Mm. Okay, which right. Mm-hmm. Is so they were reading. This is kind of a tangent, like away from whether I whatever question that asked. I already forgot. But oh, um, Lewis and Tolkien are both reading this book, um, an experiment with time, which has to do with dreams and the future, and. You can see their various ways of dealing with this theme. There is actually some doubt over the authenticity of the Dark Tower, but All right, it yeah. makes sense mm-hmm. to me that mm-hmm. he would have written this, where um, they build a, a chronoscope to look back in time because something with the human mind and dreams and like a membrane or whatever that's there. And it, it is a similar kind of like group of academics doing a, an experiment and then like stuff goes wrong and, and then it ends because it's a fragment. But that's what I was thinking of the entire time was it's mm. got that same. And there's the, in the Dark Tower, there's a very similar discussion about dreams and time because mm. um, this book, An Experiment with Time, um, I haven't read it, but I know enough about it to kind of get the <laughs> This mm-hmm. guy um, in the 20s kept a, he noticed that some of his dreams were kind of like, he could get deja vu and go, oh my God, I dreamed this moment. Mm. And so he started keeping a, a dream journal. Like, mm-hmm. you know, tonight I dreamed, I don't know, that I was walking down this road or whatever. I don't know the, don't know the examples that he uses. And after enough time of keeping this journal, discovered that he was dreaming little fragments of the future. And I, I don't know what conclusions he draws from that, aside from, like, apparently human mind as a voyager upon the vast oceans of time. I don't know. Tolkien and Lewis both had this book, and both were, like, in their own ways, like, oh, okay, well, there's a prompt for a story. And then I think it's funny <laughs> they both never finished. <laughs> <laughs> like but a lot of dreams, this, like, you dream it, and then you wake up. <laughs> and then... Yeah. And I think, I mean, if he had just dug more into that dream aspect and left all the academic stuff out of it we would mm-hmm. be much yeah much just get rid of this framing device entirely yeah. like it could literally just be a dream journal if you want it i don't care like right? or they all separately keep a dream journal i don't know it's it's a little, little late to give them suggestions on how to revise this but <laughs> <laughs> well look maybe if we dream enough we can we can figure out can a go way back in time well, what's funny, this is another tangent that might make me sound kind of insane, but upon reading The Dark Tower when I was like 13, I was like, oh, that's interesting, and then kind of discovered a similar thing would happen with dreams that I had had. Yeah. And I was like, oh, God, oh, is it true? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so Experiment of Time is the, 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 the ring of its day? Are you watch it and then you sort of read it? And oh, you my God. Like, oh my God. Yeah, well, I was, yeah, well, I was like, oh, that's such a cool concept, and then realized, like, I think a week later, I was like, oh, my God, I dreamed this exactly moment like a year ago oh no my the only prophetic dream i've ever really had was i was around 13 or 14 and my coach had grown a beard because his his hockey team i want to say was in the playoffs Mm -hmm. and he was like i'm not shaving until until they lose and my family was not a sports watching family we did not ever watch sports and this was like pre internet where you got news i did not Mm -hmm. so i didn't know the game was happening or anything but that night i did dream that my coach shaved his playoff beard and then the next morning when i went to practice he had shaved his beard so time time travel yeah be a dream it's a thing i we're wandering so far off topic here i'm sorry ned but like the example that i always that I think of, which is the one that happened like shortly after reading this book, I think, was mm-hmm. I had dreamed some years ago about putting shoes on a little blonde girl that I was holding in my lap on a hardwood floor in a very brightly lit, like sunlit white room. And when I woke up, I was like, is that a ski lodge? I don't know, because I was like 12 or something. I didn't. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a room I recognized. And then a couple years later, we moved, moved houses one day, like the week that we had moved there. We were gonna i don't know, go out to lunch or something because we didn't have the fridge running i forget and i was instructed to put shoes on my little sister who had oh, not mm. been born when i had the dream Whoa. 
mm-hmm. and I was sitting there putting her shoes on, holding her in my lap, little blonde girl, and I was like, oh, damn. This is the room. This is the thing. This is exactly what she was wearing. Blue That's overalls, crazy. pink shirt with white spots. And I just, I was like, oh, am, <laughs> like, am I a protagonist? What's happening? And then, <laughs> am I a dreamer? Do I have, do I have, do the, I have the sight upon me? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, other things like that have happened. And I, you can, I don't know, call mental health services if you want. I don't know. But like, <laughs> so it makes this, that, I think that's part of why, even though I really didn't like a lot of the Notion Club papers, I was mm-hmm. like, this concept is irresistible to me. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because, because I've lived <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can't say I've ever had a particular dream like that, or at least one that's, you know, that lingers in the memory so much. Uh, for me, it's more a certain... Yeah, I could say frustration over, you know, sometimes I seem to be composing symphonies in my dream and I wake up and I'm like, if only I could remember the music. If this <laughs> yeah, say man. This, this, I'm sure this is, you know, very common, but, you know, given that I, you know, write about music, I think it's one of those things like, oh, <laughs> you, know? Like, you know, you hear about things like, you know, uh, I can't remember was, uh, I think it was both, uh, both Paul McCartney and uh, Keith Richards tell similar stories about waking up suddenly having a riff for a key song in their head. If I remember right, I want to say it was maybe my machine or, uh, my Michelle for uh, McCartney and uh, for for uh, for Keith Richards, I believe, was the actual riff for Satisfaction. They were just like ah, and they immediately tried to you know using whatever sixties technology has like mm-hmm. record and get something down before I forget yeah. this. And you yeah, know, there you go. So I understand that impulse there too. Yeah, I mean the thing is, is that if it would have been interesting if we had gotten in the end an essay or something from Tolkien showing like these are how I interpret my dreams and this is how this may impact sort of what I've created. Even if it's a private reflection or something like that, but yeah. maybe just didn't have her figure out the audience, didn't know if anyone would be interested, didn't know there's any easy way to even explain his friends, it. even his friends are like, I don't want to hear about this man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it might have been just too much. I mean, or maybe something sort of talked about and whatever. I mean, it's interesting that he appears in the Notion Club papers more or less as a brief yeah. mention of a character who had written some sort of like basically he was doing his he was doing he was doing the worst possible version of his future that he could think of. He's sort of like basically like. And Sarah is like, oh, yeah, some guy wrote some stories and they're over here in a heap in the corner and things like this. Like, all his life's work would just be nothing mm-hmm. <laughs> over there. He was just sort of like, that was his way of looking at it, which I, I could totally understand. <laughs> it's just sort of like men, yeah. men will write the Notion Club papers instead of going to therapy. <laughs> to therapy. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, he also shows up as the professor of Anglo-Saxon yeah. who translates a fragment of Tengwar script. And and Professor it, Rashbold. Professor Rashbold. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is, I, I loved him. I was, I wish he was part of the book more because yeah. just the people talking about him was so funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're just like, we took it to this weirdo who knows Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> I think again, once or twice, once or twice, some good Tolkien humor like emerges. Yeah. Like my favorite, my favorite, uh, my favorite bit easily has to be something to do in the interminable spaceship discussion, where it says <sighs> something sort of like it's along the lines of, you know, well, yeah, you get a spaceship, but you know, if you get in, you know, if you get in and take the train and go somewhere, there's still there's a pretty good chance that you will be alive at the end of your train journey. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Joke about what is it, the National Railway or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And and the weird sort of suggestions about things that happen because he's writing when World War II is essentially wrapping up, but mm-hmm. it you know it is the weird way that the war itself is discussed, and then apparently how things get really wrong after that. It's interesting. He was not apparently looking optimistically towards the post-war state of things, <laughs> at mm-hmm. least in this vision of it. Like you know things are calmer, but things have been sort of like nah, there for a while. It's you know a state of mind that's you know much more in line with something like you know dare I say you know Orwell writing 1984 shortly after yeah. the war. Or, and things yeah. like this going like, you know, things things are looking bad, um, even though he didn't really dwell into that much. It's just simply, you know, bits and pieces of you know background color, you could say. But um, but OK. okay. And the other the other funny moment, the one clearly drawn from life, because you know, Christopher Tolkien says as much was the barber Norman Keeps. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and that's that. It's an honest to god bit of humor. On the one hand, it's a bit of a sort of snobby bit of humor because it's about like ah, these people who aren't academics like us don't know these yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's that. At the same time, it's sort of like no, that's about right. And it's sort of like the idea that this is there. There's something. It's something telling about this. So like, oh, we don't know our barber's name, but we just call him Norman Keeps. I'm like, he's your barber. You see, right? <laughs> also, like to be kind of the most sympathetic. 
character like in the like the the best drawn almost yeah i mean he has a personality and what he's saying is like you know halfway to communism frankly it's all like proto Karl marx he's basically saying like yeah these bad nobles locked up all the people and all the rest of them like i'm down with this guy (laughs) yeah it did (laughs) it kind of reminded me of the monty python uh bit the the holy grail bit where they come across the peasants (laughs) political scientists yeah Yeah. (laughs) So, so they, they, they leap out, of course, because they are so relatively entertaining. After all, you know, various you know five paragraphs yeah. of whatever. So, but it's one yeah. of those things like, oh man, the, the, go there, you know, please, please give yeah. us more of this, you know, give us a little yeah. more. And images and things like you know, Loudon being you know declaiming at the windows, you know, one thing, but also the idea that after the fl- in the streets are flooded and wrecked, you know, it's like you know a hint of a hint of J.G. Ballard right there in a weird sort mm-hmm. of way, you know, not you know not equivalent, but it's sort of like oh okay, you know, civilization suddenly getting crushed from the outside a bit and things like that. So there's there these, these little bits and pieces. One thing that I did like, and this is something that's developed more in the associated manuscripts that are also included with uh, the Notion Club papers uh, about uh, the development of the Numenor myth, was this idea that he was trying to tell a version of the Numenor story, and we do get this in the Notion Club papers, where we get another summation of sort of what happened, but it's from the point of view that it's not it's it's not an accurate take, it's more like these are men of later generations trying to figure out what happened. That's mm-hmm. an interesting bit of historicity right there, that normally we're trying to get things that are straight from, you know, the Elven records about what really happened in Numenor or maybe things from that. Instead, it's more sort of like this is what we think happened. Mm -hmm. (laughs) This is what we're guessing happened. And the names are not the familiar forms of the names that we know. They're they're very different. And again, in the other manuscripts, there are even more variants of the names put on. It's sort of like, you don't get the Valar, you don't get Melkor, you get these alternate names. You know, Tolkien, Mm -hmm. uh, not Tolkien, Sauron is uh, given Zigur as a name in uh, in this, which is one of those things like, Zigur? What? Where's that come from <laughs> which is kind of great though because again yeah. you're getting yeah. this idea that these are the stories being told from this sort of way it that's not something we really get in tolkien at least nothing so specific in terms of things like that it's interesting to sort of see it in that light it makes for an interesting experiment as opposed to nothing truly successful but it's nice to see actually it's sort of like him yeah. going like well what if i did it this way yeah i mean if you push that further because there, there are there are fragments included like the one that professor rashbold translates there are mm-hmm. these sort of things that loud him and um, jeremy the guy yeah. who's like again like sam but introduced too late kind of thing um <laughs> these things that they are seeing in their dreams and like being able to write out and what they're seeing are not like the accurate accounts they're mm-hmm. seeing mm-hmm. records that somebody else made and they're reproducing those yeah. records and there are so many mm-hmm. removes from the truth that it's like that is so that is so interesting as a metafictional thing yeah i don't know how you would sustain that over an entire novel but in itself <laughs> like reading that and going oh this is like what what jeremy is seeing in his dream is maybe not accurate because he's dreaming we don't know and what he's seeing is somebody's notes taken from a record written by human beings i, I think it's like i can't remember the exact like provenance of this thing but it's like a record in gondor or something kind mm-hmm. of vibe of what happened in numenor thousands of years ago so it's at these like again it's so many room of so many layers and yeah. it's like that that is so cool but <laughs> But of and, course, then the, and then the Langobards are also there because, yeah, of okay. course, they, they have be. to be. Yeah. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> yeah. Once, once more with feeling. I can't. Yeah. No, 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 no skulls serve the daughters this time out, though. So a little yeah. more straightforward. And no, there, and so. no naked sons in the in the, the last dying rays. Of the, I was kind of surprised <laughs> well, that that wasn't there. in there. He would have gotten right? there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we don't know what those two did when they disappeared for a while from the club papers. Oh, they couldn't God. do okay, anything. Is that, is I was that, like, is that the like, like you do, like is that the implication? I, I'm not sure if it was, but it felt like it. Right? Mm-hmm. I was I was reading this and going, okay, like of course you go on vacation with your friend significantly to go... younger, so, right? Who? Jeremy yeah. is like well, a younger they're, is they're younger. younger, but I think they're like it's not it's not a creepy age gap, if I recall correctly. But yeah, right after a disaster. <laughs> yeah, they get they just gotta get out and go to the go to the beach together and like I feel like they sleep in the same hotel room. I don't know. It just it felt like unintentional unintent- or not, it was like, okay, I know what's <laughs> going on here, even if he doesn't. <laughs> Probably true, actually. So I can easily see that. So, I mean, this it it all it all comes together as sort of like you know something I think you know where I think we're all agreed on is that there are all these interesting bits 
but mm-hmm. they're bits <laughs> and they're yeah. lost in a larger thing. That's sort of like, it's almost like if you decided on one thing or another as a proper core thing to go through, then yeah. this wouldn't feel like such a weird interweaving of a bunch of different like things. He's like throwing the, it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, you know, throwing things out there and seeing what sticks is kind of yeah. the idea. Which is, and, I mean, it is what which a draft is, fine. is for. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I do. I, as much as we've ragged on the spaceship discussion as an object, it is actually really interesting as like, this is right at the beginning of what we think of as science fiction now. Mm-hmm. And this is a book, or it would have been a book, that is so interested in the possibilities and the meaning of science fiction as an art form. Mm-hmm. And that is fascinating, even if I would have preferred it not to be in the final, <laughs> whatever the final version was. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, he, he, we know that he read science fiction, obviously, because mm-hmm. there's yeah. a very intelligent discussion about it. Mm-hmm. If lengthy and dense, he's like, he knows his stuff mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he's wondering what it means and what the purpose of aspects of it are. Like, it, and it, it, one of the things that makes it so interesting is that this is, again, before rockets going mm-hmm. into space and all mm-hmm. of that. And mm-hmm. he's, mm-hmm. so he's seeing the spaceship entirely as a metaphor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like, and what does that mean for the world in which it is possible? And what other things are possible in that world? And what does that mean to the people who are doing, who are on the ship? And it it's way more interesting to think about than to read, mm-hmm. but it is still a thing that's happening that is interesting to think about. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and I think it's very interesting too that uh, his one of his other chief examples. I mean, clearly C.S. Lewis is most on his mind and is obviously referenced at various points. But uh, but uh, the one that's also brought up more than once is David Lindsay in the Voyage to Arcturus. Yeah, uh, a very yeah. strange mm-hmm. and unusual novel. Um, and uh, but one that you know its reputation carried on for some time. I still remember you know hearing about it when I was growing up. Like, oh, there's this thing. I'm like, huh? but the thing is, is, I find it very interesting that he specifically chooses that, and he does not choose another example which he could have done which fits in with this discussion in its own way but uh which uh he would not have chosen for many reasons and that is good old er edison and uh mm-hmm. and the worm Ouroboros, which has yeah. its oh, own I, I read the beginning of that yesterday to prepare for this to see if it had any bearing on the <laughs> discussion because yeah. <laughs> there is that weird it, it's a very similar deal you know the idea mm-hmm. of you know, an englishman transferred a little space trend things like that and all the rest of it and tolkien if you wanted to could have brought it up because theoretically everything is happening on the planet mercury and in, in that novel Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, one clearly, it's not really, and two, you know, the, Tolkien does not want to give Edison any more than the time that he feels he deserves, which is very little because he has his real problems with him philosophically, and I get that. So yeah. I think it is interesting that 100%. you know he wants to, you know, he, hmm, yeah, let's preserve <laughs> one with the other. Yeah, <laughs> we can spare. We can remember talking talk more, more about Edison the other day. We've done that once or twice before. Problematic the, fave. Edison yeah, is yeah. a problematic fave for yeah, me. Yeah. I reread his books like every couple of years and i love the language but yeah it's like okay <laughs> yeah we, we'll get we, a different we, episode <laughs> yeah different episode we'll get to some point check, check our check our sir uh guy the green knight episode for a, a little more on uh him we talked about him then too so but um we should wrap up and i i don't know if there's anything really more to take away from this i mean the stuff that's the development of the numenor myth and the related manuscripts the adonaic stuff which is you know great for the hyper language fans it is it's sort of like oh okay here it all is um as clear as it is you know that has a relevance to legendary certainly but the papers in and of themselves it's at best a path not taken and that's really almost all one can say about it it is interesting though that it is the def- definitive end of Tolkien basically trying to square away a character in the modern world or the mundane world dealing with middle earth it's mm-hmm. sort of like after that it just doesn't recur it, it never seems to come up again in his writing in such a direct way so yeah. it's almost sort of like a hail and farewell <laughs> Maybe yeah. that's what I'll end it in my thoughts on. I think my my last thought is about one of the funniest running gags in the, <laughs> in okay. the thing, which is they're talking about names and translation fairly early on. One of the like biggest skeptics in the group, who's just like, oh come on, you guys are just making shit up, is named Philip, and somebody points out his name means lover of horses. Mm-hmm. And then after that moment, every time he talks, somebody refers to him as horsey. <laughs> <laughs> and it felt like that tweet about like the the group chat with the, the grink. grink. It was the grink, <laughs> and I was like, "This is." It felt even like for like it felt stuffy because it was like a group of stuffy people. But it felt a lot of the time like a real conversation they'd be having, even if even if it was hard to read. It's like yeah, yeah. This, this, this feels realistic in some way. <laughs> yeah, you're joshing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, the choice of topic has come back to Oriana. What are we talking about next time? We talk in Noldor. <laughs> oh, who are, who are okay. these people? What what is their deal? What is their narrative function, etc. So it's mm. it'll be sort of like part primer for, you know, people who are maybe a little less who care a little less about that kind of thing. You're going to care about it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we can go a little more in-depth for people who are, who are already in the know. Nice choice, yeah. I will say, uh, just quickly, that I am halfway through Andy Circus's reading of The Silmarillion at this point, mm. uh, which I'm enjoying. And if people out there are like, the Noldor, what's the deal? You could do worse than to listen to that audiobook if you haven't had a chance to read The Silmarillion yet, because then you have Andy Circus reading it at you and doing character yeah. voices and things Ooh, like this. What does Feanor sound like? <laughs> Oh yeah, intense. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'll. Yeah, maybe I'll. Maybe I'll like take the plunge and and actually listen. To yeah, the no, it, 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 he he makes some interesting choices. There are a couple of ones I'm sort of like, I don't know. I never quite configured the character that way, but this holds off into another discussion and things like that. So, and I think he does a solid job. So much as he did with the other ones, but uh, but yeah. So the recommendation there, but the older next time, good deal. Yeah. Okay, well, so thank the possibilities. you. Possibilities. I'm so excited. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it's going to be good. It, uh, it it is already making me think of a few things to, to think about. So right, but, uh, right. <laughs> yeah. There you go. So uh, until next time, then thank you as always so much for listening. Megaphonic FM slash by the bywater is where to find us. Again, uh, we are all more or less really located to Blue Sky, including uh, of course the main uh, by the bywater social media account. It's still in closed beta mode though, so unless you're on there, you won't be able to find us. But we have had a number of people joining us there. We really appreciate it. Uh, more people. Uh, listening in. We're getting uh, various kind comments and compliments, as always. Deeply appreciated. Thank you very much. We had someone tell us, uh, I think, over the past few weeks that we were they thought we were the best Tolkien podcast out there. We'll take oh. that judgment. Thank you very much. We're doing our best. So it's, a, it's an individual prize, but we appreciate it very much. Um, so cross fingers, so that way strikes can be over. Pre-order Jared's thing. Do good things out there and all that. Hope you have a very good uh, October coming up. Hey, we're in the spooky season. Hope it's a very good Yes. October in the month. Fire up all the things that you'll be wanting to do with, uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, it's in Roger Zelazny's Hunt for the Lonesome October. I think this is the book that a lot of people have been reading, if I remember that title right. So get around to that again. But anyway, that said, we will talk to you all again next time. Until then. <laughs>